What's up guys, Alex here with Red Hot MTG and the deck tech that I got for you today is Karazakar the Eye Tyrant. So forgive me if I butcher his name, but it's a 5-5 Beholder for 3 black and red that has the ability whenever you attack a player, tap target creature that player controls and goad it. And whenever an opponent attacks another one of your opponents, you and that player each draw a card and lose one life. So this Rakdos commander wants to be attacking and forcing our opponents to attack anybody but us. I'm a big fan of aggressive strategies and this unique commander gives us some card advantage in the command zone and a reason for our opponents not to attack us. So with all that being said, let's get into the cards that are going to make this strategy work. So the main strategy of the deck is getting our opponents to attack, even if they don't want to. So this category focuses on some redundant effects like our commanders that force our opponents to attack. So to start out, we have Geode Rager and Grinzo Havoc Razor, both of which give us repeatable ways to goad our opponent's creatures. Grinzo is a great card in this deck because it also gives us the option to impulsive draw from our opponent's decks if we have already goaded their creatures. Geode Rager is a bit high costed for its goad ability, but it's a relatively new mechanic without a lot of options, and it's important to make sure we can force our opponents to attack as often as possible. But as future sets come out and we get more options, this could be one of the cards to look at replacing. Although, combined with fetch lands, it can be a very reliable way to goad multiple of our opponent's creatures per turn. And with a 4-3 first strike body, it's a pretty decent attacker and defender if needed. Next up, we have two 4-drop creatures with Goblin Racketeer and Vengeful Ancestor that allow us to goad our opponents when they attack. Vengeful Ancestor also has the added ability that goaded creatures will burn their controllers from one damage when they attack, which just gives us added value. Then we have two single-use sorceries with Besmirch and Disrupt Decorum. Besmirch allows us to take one of our opponent's creatures and attack with it that turn, and then goad it so when it goes back to its owner at the end of turn, it can't attack us for another turn cycle. Disrupt Decorum is a simple and very powerful 4-drop spell that goads all of our opponent's creatures. This can be a great spell in any aggressive deck because it can clear the way for us to openly attack any of our opponents since they will only have blockers if some of their creatures had summoning sickness or they could untap after combat. Next up we have Bloodthirsty Blade, Shiny Impetus, and Parasitic Impetus. Goad typically only lasts for a turn so we will need to continuously goad our opponents to ensure they keep attacking, but these three permanents can attach to a creature and keep them continuously goaded. They each also buff those creatures, which can help ensure that our opponents do take each other's life totals down faster. Shining Impetus, I think, is the best out of these three because it generates us treasure when the creature it's attached to attacks. Parasitic Impetus has the added value of draining the controller for two and gaining us two life, but this is one of those cards that I'll be looking to upgrade once there are more efficient options. Then we have some cards that force our opponents to attack, but don't have the goad keyword. So, to start off, we have two creatures, Goblin Diplomat and Carter Doom Scourge. Goblin Diplomats can be tapped to force each creature to attack during that turn, which effectively means we can make one of our opponents attack with everything. Then, Carter is essentially another Disrupt Decorum, because it essentially goads all of our opponents the turn it comes in, and it also has the added value of draining our opponents for one when their attacking creatures die. And finally, we have two enchantments with Curse of the Nightly Hunt and War's Toll. The curse can be placed on one of our opponents and forces all of their creatures to attack every turn. And War's Toll forces every able creature to attack when any other creature does so, which works great with our single target goat effects. It also forces our opponents to tap out their lands when they tap any of them, which can be detrimental to control decks and players who like leaving up mana for interaction. The only thing to note is that these and Goblin Diplomat's abilities do not prevent our opponents from attacking us. Aggressive creature based strategies are not the most popular in my experience, and our whole strategy relies on getting value from forcing our opponents to slug it out with each other. So with these cards, we are going to make sure that our opponents have the creatures that they need to attack. The best of these is going to be Varchild, Betrayer of Keldor, and Rite of the Raging Storm. These two spells will give our opponents tokens and have the stipulation built into them that they cannot be used against us. When Varchild leaves the battlefield, we will also get any surviving survivors that are on the field. 
Next up, we have Goblin Spy Master, which gives our opponents a 1-1 Goblin at each of their end steps. And these tokens give us more redundancy by forcing our opponents to attack. My only issue with this card is that they get these tokens at the end of their turn. So they can't swing with these tokens the turn they come out if they happen to have a haste enabler. And the tokens don't affect them that turn. Then we have two aggressively costed beaters with Hunted Dragon and Hunted Horror. Each give our opponents six power worth of creature tokens. That's supposed to be a downside for getting a 6-6 Flying Haste or a 7-7 Trample for only 5 mana and 2 mana respectively. But in this deck, it's an added benefit, making these some of the best cards in the deck. Next up, we have a Crow and Horse and Genesis Chamber, which are two effective artifacts that continuously generate tokens for us and our opponents. Then we have Curse of Disturbance, which can be placed on one player and then every other player that attacks them gets to create a 2-2 zombie token. And finally, we have Zoncha, Sleeper Agent, which enters the battlefield under an opponent's control and is essentially always goaded, and also gives us and our other opponents a way to draw cards and drain the controller at the same time. It's probably obvious to most, but it's worth mentioning that there will be decks that take advantage of our gifted bodies more than most. For example, Aristocrat Strategies, so make sure you carefully identify the most effective ways to use these cards in this category to make sure we don't give certain opponents too much value that they'll blow us out. In this short little section, I'm just going to mention these two cards, Causal, Tyrant of the Cliffs, and Crawl Space. Making the battlefield into a big slugfest and fueling our opponent's armies does come at the risk that there will be times that some of these resources are pointed at us. So having some effects like this to cushion us a little more can be very important, especially since not all of our effects prevent our attacking opponents from hitting us. To round out the list, we have some good utility cards for our strategy. The first two creatures we have here are Frenzied Saddle Brute and Frontier Warmonger. Saddle Brute gives all of our opponent's creatures a better haste because they still can't tap them for activated abilities and they can't swing at us if they have summoning sickness, but they can swing at our other opponents. Then Frontier Warmonger makes creatures harder to block when they attack our opponents by granting them menace. Next up we have one of my new favorites, Port Razor. It's a 5-drop 4-4 Pirate Orc that gives us extra combat steps when it deals combat damage to a player, and in the best cases gives us 3 extra combats per turn if we can hit each of our opponents. Obviously that is based on a 4-player commander game. Then we have Brash Taunter and Sir Conrad the Grim. Brash Taunter is a great blocker because it has indestructible and can send any damage it takes at any of our opponents, and can force itself to fight something. This is another card on my radar for upgrading, but I'm always surprised by how much work it actually does in a game, so I've kept it in this list. Then, Sir Conrad just deals so much damage throughout a game if it's left unanswered, because if any creature leaves or enters the grave for any reason, it pings all of our opponents. Next up, we have Valakut Awakening slash Valakut Stoneforge and Faithless Looting, both of which pitch cards and allow us to draw that many to smooth out our draws and replace dead cards. Valakut Awakening can also have the flexibility of being played as a land in situations where we're completely satisfied with our hand or you're desperate for lands. This is the modal card in red that I find myself slotting into almost all of my red decks that don't run too many tapped lands because it can take a land slot instead of a spell slot and can be used for exactly what we need every time we draw it. Now this next one I know is not that good, but I think it's kind of fun to have some chaos effects in decks, so I fit in Chaos Dragon. It's a pretty relevant and aggressive body as a 4-4 flying haste for only 3 mana, but it can be pretty random on who it can attack because of the dice rolling. If you're going for a more competitive build though, this is probably the first card you'd want to replace. And finally we have Underworld Breach and Mob Rule. Underworld Breach can allow you to play as much from your grave as you have the mana and things to exile, but can often win the game with the amount of value it can generate. This is another red card that I basically put into every deck now. Then, Mob Rule can steal all the tokens that we gave our opponents throughout the game, as well as most, if not all of their other creatures, and could potentially win the game out of nowhere if played correctly.
To start out the ramp category, we have the basic, soul ring, and arcane signet. Then we have Mindstone, Hedron Archive, and Curse Mirror. Since Karazakar costs 5, I don't mind running a couple more expensive mana rocks that offer us additional utility than just ramp. And Cursed Mirror is another new card I've been pretty impressed with as it can be a good draw if we get it early or late game. Next up we have Ruby Medallion. This is not a budget card but definitely worth it for the amount of mana it can save us throughout a game. This build leans pretty heavily into red so even though this is typically seen in mono colored decks you'll definitely notice the value it generates. Then we have Dowsing Dagger, a 2 cost equipment with equip 2 that gives one of our opponents 2 defending plant tokens, gives the equipped creature plus 2 plus 1, and when equipped creature deals combat damage it transforms into Lost Veil, vale, which is a land that can tap for 3 mana of any one color. This is a great ramp option in aggressive strategies and is almost perfect with what this deck wants to do anyways. The only thing I wish is that the tokens it generated didn't have defender due to our specific strategy. Next we have Grim Hireling and Revel in Riches, which both can produce a large amount of treasure tokens throughout a game and give us additional value for those treasure tokens. Then we have two more equipment that ramp us with Sword of Hearth and Home and Sword of the Animist, both of which can get us a basic land from our library onto the field when the equipped creature deals combat damage or attacks. Next we have a classic with Solemn Simulacrum which gets a land when it ETBs and draws us a card when it dies. And finally we have two temporary ramp spells with Jessica's Will and Mana Geyser, both of which can generate a lot of mana to turn their cast to make some big plays and Jessica's Will can impulsively draw us three cards as well if our commander is out. To start out our draw, we have three very efficient black draw spells with Sign and Blood, Read the Bones, and Ancient Craving, each of which draws us some cards at the cost of that much life. Sign and Blood does cost two black pips, and I chose it over Knight's Whisper because I like the Japanese Mystical Archive version and have a very efficient mana base, but if you're not running an optimized land base, Knight's Whisper would probably be the better option. Then we have more long-term card advantage spells with Phyrexian Arena and Emberwild Captain. Phyrexian Arena is another classic that gets us an extra card each turn. Emberwild Captain gives us card advantage by introducing the Monarch into our game. The Monarch is one of my favorite abilities in Commander and can be great for this deck because it gives additional encouragement for our opponents to attack, even if that sometimes might be aimed at us. But with most or all of their creatures goaded, we could potentially be the Monarch for the entire game. Next, we have a wheel effect with Wheel of Misfortune, another one of those fun chaos style cards that I like to play and discarding your hand to draw a new 7 is very powerful in aggressive strategies. And it's usually pretty easy to make sure you get to take advantage of it because in my experience there is usually at least one player that doesn't want to discard their hand so they'll just pick 0. And finally we have some less conventional means of card advantage with Dothy Voidwalker and Itali Primal Storm. Dothy Voidwalker can really hose opponents who rely on their graveyards for their strategy and we can also play a card exile it if we needed to a single time. Then if Atali is allowed to attack even once it could potentially get us up to 4 spells for free and generate a lot of value. To round out our deck list we have some interactive cards that allow us to answer what our opponents are doing. And to start out, we have Malakir Rebirth slash Malakir Mire. This is another one of those cards I find myself putting into almost every black deck because it can be played as a land if you need it, but if you don't need it, it can save one of your creatures whenever it would die for only 1 mana and 2 life, and generally every deck needs their commander to function efficiently, so every deck has at least one creature they will want to protect. Then we have 3 targeted removal spells with Feed the Swarm, Chaos Warp, and Terminate. There are many viable options for these slots, but I chose these due to their flexibility and mana values. Red and Black typically has a hard time of dealing with enchantments, which can be some of the most powerful spells in the game. So Feed the Swarm and Chaos Warp give us an opportunity to answer them if we need to, even though they have the downsides of being a sorcery or an effect that potentially gives them something worse. 
Next, we have Ractive's Charm, which is another very flexible and powerful spell and commander, especially in this deck where we are actively trying to build our opponent's armies. So, the final ability could be a win condition for us. And finally, we have two board wipes with Blasphemous Act and Rolling Earthquake. This deck doesn't want to be board wiping too often because our opponents can't swing at each other if they don't have any creatures. But sometimes a board wipe is the only way to stop an opponent from winning or at least keep you from dying if our opponent's boards have gotten to the point where we cannot control where their damage is going. So it's always good to have at least a couple in your deck. Black has very good options for board wipes as well that you could consider. But I chose these because, in my opinion, Blasphemous Act is probably the best board wipe in the game, being able to be played for only one mana in a vast majority of situations. And then Rolling Earthquake can hit everything without horsemanship and players, which means if we have the mana and a little more life than our opponents, this could be used as a finisher. I'm not going to go over my entire land base, but I will go over some of the standouts. Cabal Coffers and Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth is a very powerful land combination that getting out will increase your odds of victory by a sizable amount. Then we have the red and black castles with Castle Embrith and Lochthwain, which will almost always come into play untapped in this deck and give us a little extra utility if we have the mana to spare. So there is little to no cost in replacing some of our basics with lands like these. Next up is Myriad Landscape, which I find myself putting into a lot of my decks that don't have green in them because the other colors really don't have great ways of land-based ramp, and this is a pretty decent option. Then we have Den of the Bugbear and Kerkeep, which can get us bodies on the field if we are desperate or have the extra mana. And finally, the land I include in every red deck that I build, Handware Battlements. Haste can just be an incredibly powerful ability because it doesn't give our opponents time to deal with all the creatures you play and spending 2 mana to give something haste is a very low investment on a land that enters the battlefield untapped. Karazakar is a really fun commander that causes a little chaos in the game by hopefully turning the board into an all out brawl with you taking the least amount of hits. He also offers a unique form of card advantage that keeps you going throughout the game and can gain some goodwill with the other players, so maybe they won't get mad at you for forcing them to attack everyone else. My favorite thing about this deck is that I was able to use cards effectively that most people would look at and consider bad, sometimes really bad. For example, when I first saw the Impetus Enchantment Cycle released in the Commander Precons a couple years ago, I almost threw them away because I thought that they were very bad. But they fit this deck's theme very well and offer us some redundancy in our goat effect while also offering some additional utility. And that is the great thing about Commander in general, since the diversity of deck and strategies allow a lot of niche cards that are typically seen as bad a place to be played effectively. So I hope you enjoyed this build and have fun manipulating your opponents into an all out slugfest. Leave a comment down below with any cards that you would put into your build. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Enjoy.